So let me begin by thanking you. Now, thanks for being here. It's wonderful to see the turnout. This is an important topic. It's one I care deeply about. I know many of you care deeply about. And I want to, uh, to do a couple things tonight. I want to invite you to see the world a little bit differently. And I'm talking about the quest for truth in a technological age. We live in this technological world. It's true. You know this. And it's very exciting and dizzying and all the things that are happening. And it's also a little bit scary or unsettling, at least to people like me. Science and religion are a part of our lives, as I will make the point tonight. And the topic of the dialogue between the two disciplines uh, has had a contentious history. Uh, and yet today in 2017 is extremely exciting uh, in both science circles and theological and religious circles. And I want to invite you tonight to <clears throat> step back from the field a little bit, open your minds, open your hearts, and uh, maybe see the world a bit differently than you have before. So let me do a, uh, one thing in advance, and that is to tell you a, a, a nugget about myself. Uh, so I'm an electrical engineering professor at Georgia Tech. I don't have a single degree in engineering. Shh, don't tell anybody that. They may kick me out. Uh, instead, actually, all my degrees are in physics. So yes, I am a scientist, and I want to talk about science tonight and challenge slash invite you to think about science maybe in a little bit different way. So I am a scientist. Uh, I am also a person of deep religious faith. And no, that is not an oxymoron. Uh, and I want to, to, to unpack that a little bit for you tonight. So um, uh, let's talk about this topic. And of course, you can appreciate, or I think you can appreciate, that in my own personal life, uh, reconciling what I do as a profession and what I believe as a human person on this planet, very important to me, actually and I think probably important to many people. So I want to start with my favorite view of our Earth. You look at that and you go, oh, I've seen that before. That's the blue marble. That's the Earth we live upon. It's beautiful. Actually, it is beautiful. As a scientist, I look at that with my mouth open, just in absolute awe of what it takes to make an image like that. You better develop mathematics and all that that means uh, you better develop chemistry and material science. Uh, you better get physics under wraps. Uh, you better develop every one of the engineering disciplines in the field of optics and space travel and combustion and aeronautics and everything that it takes to get that image and send it back to our planet. That's an amazing thing, and I think it's something to celebrate uh, as a civilization, actually, that we've done such a thing, actually. It's amazing. And yet, as a spiritual person, I look at that image in a different way. I look at that place with great reverence, uh, with great feeling and depth of experience. I look at that in a way which speaks to my heart at a very deep level, because to me, it is holy ground. And reconciling those two perspectives of this beautiful place is what I want to explore with you tonight. So first, I want to step back from our world uh, and, uh, and just invite you to appreciate what is going on and why it's cool and why it's a little scary. And then uh, we'll talk about how science got us there. So this is our new world. Uh, first text message was sent in 1992. Uh, there will be 25 billion of those sent today, preferably not during this talk, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but you never know. Uh, the world's first tweet was sent in 2006. Uh, there will be 400 million of those sent today, give or take a few. Uh, maybe we could do with a few less, but you never know these types of things. Uh, 500 million Google queries made today, which always makes me wonder, who answered BG before Google, right? Who answered all these questions? One in three couples that are married in the United States last year met online. It's a different model. It's a different world. In this new world, you could actually trace that. I just want you to step back and appreciate for a moment. The time to reach a 50 million person audience took radio 38 years to do that. TV, 13 years. The internet, four years. iPod, three years. Facebook, two years. And of course, we're spending 700 billion minutes a month on Facebook. I wonder if that's a good thing or not. Maybe you do too. Uh, but it's certainly very active. Computers connected to the internet. In 1984, 
uh, roughly when I graduated at Georgia Tech, about 1,000 computers to this rudimentary network that was out there. By 1992, a million computers. By 2008, uh, a, a billion computers. And by 2017, we're above 2 billion computers. And the point is that things are happening very rapidly. And we know this, actually, right? But it has implications. So for instance, if you've gone out, raise your hand. Actually, I'm not even going to ask for a raise. If you went and plopped $1,000 down on, a, on the new iPhone 10, shame on you is all I can say. But, <laughs> but, but, it, but if you did, uh, I would say, uh, actually, have you ever stopped to wonder how that does its magic? Most people don't have a clue, in fact. I like to argue with my students, not argue, I tell them. The modern smartphone is uh, the most sophisticated piece of technology that humankind has ever built per unit volume, ever, period, likely ever will, in fact. And yet most people don't know how it works, right? So it's a very sophisticated object. If, uh, if uh, you took my, my dare and you take this beast home that you just plopped $1,000 down for, take it apart, get a, a chisel and a hammer and, uh, and hammer that thing apart and see what's inside and you'll see lots of stuff there, that's true, but it's actually the, the chips here shown uh, that make this all go. So the magic of that phone is actually in its microelectronics, uh, which is what I do for a living, as Ken mentioned. Uh, they're beautiful things, actually. They're incredibly sophisticated, easily the most sophisticated case of manufacturing that humankind has ever successfully pulled off. And it gets more amazing than that. So what LEGO is used to enable all this? It's actually something called the transistor. Some of you know that term. Uh, if you don't, you should add it to your vocabulary. It is that important. The amazing thing, actually, is it was discovered slash invented in 1947. I'm a student of history, and I think it's a cool fact that we can actually put our finger on the exact moment when the world changed irrevocably, uh, and it's, I would argue, the most pivotal uh, invention of human history, not an overstatement, I think. It happened at about 5 p.m. on December 23rd, a Friday, uh, in Murray Hill, New Jersey in 1947, when these three gentlemen called their bosses over and said, hey, boss, look what I found, actually. That invention of the transistor changes everything about what it means to be a human on planet Earth. The remarkable fact is if you look at that same transistor, which is roughly thumbnail sized in 2017, it's now only a couple hundred atoms across. Again, think of the manufacturing and science and engineering and everything else that it takes to create such an object. Uh, and you might logically wonder, well, how many transistors you figure we've made? Well, that's a good question. People actually are, have a vested interest in answering that. I'll give you the number. It's about 80 million, million, million transistors uh, sit on planet Earth. That's about 8 times 10 to the 19th, if you don't like my zeros. But I think bigness is an important thing to appreciate. The amazing fact of that is that each of those transistors, as absolutely sophisticated a problem it is to cre create it, uh, cost about a nanodollar per. Or said another way, I'll give you 10 billion of those for a buck. Think about that. The most sophisticated thing on the planet, and I'm going to give it to you essentially for free. That tells you something that's quite remarkable about what we humans in our science have done. It gets more interesting when you start connecting these transistors together. The very first time that was done was 1958. It got the Nobel Prize. Uh, if you look in 2017, it is integrating maybe a billion of those to do interesting things. Uh, the leading edge is the Intel Xenon processor has 7.2 billion transistors using each transistor, each of those 7.2 billion, and it's only 50 atoms across, and every single one of those better work or the whole thing fails. Stop and think about that for a second. Once you have that microprocessor, you can do a remarkable things with the world, like create an internet. I like to think of Georgia Tech as the center of all life. I know some of you students do too. It actually is in this case. That's the North American internet a backbone, and you see we're kind of players right in the middle. That's kind of cool, I think. Social media has evolved, and I think the point I would make uh, is that we take that for granted in 2017. It's a very recent endeavor. Even for students today, it happened after you were born. So social media are the computer-mediated tools that allow people to create, share, and exchange information and ideas. You know that. 
Uh, look at the dates on all of these favorite ones, right? Most of them are within the last decade, maybe 15 years, not much more than that, actually. And what you can glean from that is an amazement, I hope, of the science involved in it. One transistor to an entire internet in only 70 years? Now, 70 seems like a big number, but it's not, right? Uh, and there's only one logical response any person on the planet, I would argue, could have to that very fact, and that is, wow, how did we do that? Some food for thought, actually, in that context. This is the world that's swirling around us, this dazzling world in its brilliance, and this slightly unsettling world in the way that it's changing so rapidly. Uh, transistors have profoundly affected the life that we know, the way we communicate, socialize, shop, play games, date and fall in love, create art and music, elect our leaders, practice medicine, do business, innovate, drive our cars, fight wars, invent things, raise families, teach and learn and think. All of those are 10 years earlier, not the way they are today, you know that. Uh, in some very profoundly good ways, this change has happened. And I would argue uh, in some eh, maybe not so good ways, actually. Let me show you an example. Now, as a grandparent, I can appreciate the value of FaceTime. That is a wonderful thing, in fact. And I didn't mention my great news today. I'm going to do it just because I've got a captive audience. My son and his wife just delivered our sixth grandbaby about three hours ago. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Little Jane Cresser, I think she actually looks like my wife, Maria. So, uh, yeah. So. so, that's a good thing. I love that. Actually, you students, please FaceTime your folks. They miss you, right? So, take the time to do that. Uh, this is a little more concerning to me. This is young people, not anybody here, of course. These are young people that are all uh, glued to their smartphones when they're having a social interaction. I know for a fact that this guy is texting this girl. And why, and why he doesn't just turn around and say something to her, I don't know. But why is it that way? Uh, this is even more concerning. I call this a smartphone date. You know, see, they're both looking at their things. So, so the hint to young people that are interested in these types of things, very hard to fall in love with somebody if you never look them in the eyes, right? So, so uh, you know, avoid that pitfall. Even more scarier to me is something like this. That's uh, cute. That, uh, that's actually a bad thing in my view, right? So exposing the developing brain to information technology has got lots of risks associated with it. Science is starting to roll in to support that argument. A question for the thoughtful. All of, we are, all of us are thoughtful here. How did all this come to be? This amazing stuff that's swirling around us. It was actually science that did this. And more than a tad of engineering. Go Georgia Tech, right? So, uh, so uh, yeah, we, we, we are players, right? We are players. A lot of these students in this room are players. Uh, but it's science, actually, that creates that magic. What else has science done for us lately? Well, lots of things, actually. Let me show you a couple that really inspire me. Science of the very big. Well, this is one of my favorite images of our universe. It's called the Hubble Deep Field. It's a very famous image. Everybody look here. What you do is you take your telescope and you point it to a piece of the night sky where there's nothing. And you let it start to look further and further back at, uh, to the beginning of the Big Bang time. Uh, and you accumulate light, and what you see when you develop that image is not a collection of stars, actually. You see collections of galaxies, right, looking all the way back to the very beginning of our universe. That really is both awe-inspiring and amazing to me. You can also go up in a, a, uh, at the Kobe telescope and take an image of what's known as the cosmic background. Did you know that the universe glows at minus 455 degrees? <laughs> You might say, well, that doesn't sound like much of a glow to me, but actually it is a glow. Uh, this is absolutely the predicted evidence uh, of the remnants of the Big Bang event, right? And we see that. We know it's there. It's the most direct evidence that the Big Bang actually did happen. And exoplanets, my favorite topic, life on other worlds. Well, exoplanets with the Kepler telescope, we're finding dozens by the day almost. There's hundreds, thousands of these things now. If you look at the red circle and you remember your... Your, your nursery stories, uh, Goldilocks and Three Bears, remember that? Not too, whole, not, not too cold, not too hot, not too big, not too small. Uh, well, down in the Earth-sized world where we think life might be, yeah, there's lots of them, actually. We haven't found life, clearly, but uh, there's lots of reason to think that it's getting interesting, this subject. 
How about the science of the very small? This is closer to what I do for a living. Uh, when I was a kid, this will shock some of you, when I was a kid, atoms were the smallest things there were, and you couldn't see atoms, right? Well, here is an image of the surface of a silicon crystal that clearly shows the atoms. We can image that quite trivially today. There's dozens of places on campus, in fact, that can do that. And this is one of my all-time favorites. This is a recent discovery of the Higgs boson. Uh, that is an important elementary particle that O carries mass, right? So it's the origin of mass in the world. Without mass, we don't have much to talk about. Uh, and the way you do that is with this. So uh, just for scale, this is a person standing down here. Uh, and what you do is take two proton beams moving at the speed of light, and you let them collide, and you start to have very sophisticated electronic detectors uh, to see what happens when they hit each other moving at the speed of light. And uh, that was a perfect prediction and confirmation of the Higgs boson using the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. That was just a few years ago, actually. And the science of living things, this is recent, right? It's only been less than 15 years that we decoded uh, the human genome, for instance, and uh, that's representation of DNA is, uh, again, to me, personally, uh, is both an incredibly exciting time for what we can do with it in medicine and other things, and also uh, kind of a scary time, actually, about the implications of all that. So one thing that's, it's done is helped us to decode the tree of life. We know a lot about our origins on this planet. Uh, we humans sit at the very top of this ladder, but there's lots of complexity over lots of time, and, uh, uh, and, and knowledge of that is, of course, very powerful. Uh, and we can start to do things like clone things, right? Now, you might ask, is that a good thing to do or not? Well, in the animal world, it's fairly common. Dolly actually was the first cloned animal. She didn't last very well in middle age, uh, but it was a first. Uh, however, with the new CRISPR technique and gene editing, it uh, gives me pause for thought. Uh, because uh, that allows you to begin to think about humans 2.0. A word for that is transhumans. What comes next for us as a species? And of course, there's a tremendous debate these days of whether one even gets close to human germ lines with gene editing. That's a topic of great uh, debate in the, in the world of ethics. If you do this the wrong way, you want to know what you end up with? Yeah, Terminator 2, it, it didn't, wasn't just a movie, it actually really happened, right? So that's, that's not a path you want to go down because it's going to eventually lead you here to the matrix, right? And we don't, well, yeah, you don't want to end up in the matrix, right? Why would you want that? Uh, but it's uh, uh, sort of an amazing thing that science does these things, and it's all, again, uh, within a recent uh, couple of decades, actually, this is transpiring. If you marry science to engineering, what we do at Georgia Tech, what is the natural result is technology. It's the technology that's changing things, right? But they rest upon science. And it's a gazillion million applications uh, that drive the modern world uh, in this field. You know that. And some important questions to ask would be uh, this, and I want to now zero in a little bit on the topic of science and religion, and that is, is science the only reliable means for understanding the truth? Well, that's a good question, actually. It's a deep question. It's a question I think about a lot. I think you would start by saying, well, what exactly do you mean by truth? Uh, that's a good question, too. A truth, let's say the real state of things, uh, objective reality, however we know that, uh, the really real, I'm kind of fond of that, the really real, this is the real, real stuff that we care about for objective reality. And so uh, that's a question I want to probe a little bit. And I want to step back from that field for a second and just talk about science a little bit, because I think it's actually, particularly in 2017 and all that's gone on, it's kind of poorly understood by people what science actually is and why, how it does what it does so beautifully and remarkably. So let's define science. This will be a few words here, but I think it's useful to get that on the table. Science is an enterprise which utilizes the scientific method to create, build, organize knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. It's kind of a mouthful, but that's what science is. You could follow that and say, well, what do you mean by the scientific method? Of course, most grade school kids see that. Scientific method consists of a systematic observation, measurement, and experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. That's what science is. Uh, sad to say, 
Mathematics is usually involved in that, and for very good reason, actually, because math captures the essence of the world uh, and it allows us to run, for instance, time variables forward in predictable ways. So it's a very powerful uh, language, if you would, for talking about the world of science. Let me show you an example of that, one of my favorites, and God said this, uh, and there was light. That's in the, uh, the Christian Bible in Genesis. Um, that's Maxwell's equations. Uh, everybody in here speaks vector calculus and differential equations, I hope. Students. Uh, if you don't, no worries. Uh, to me, that is a set of coupled partial differential equations which completely describe the electrodynamic world. Uh, completely, actually. And they're difficult to solve, yes. Whole uh, enterprises exist to solve those. But it will take you to the design of a smartphone and the existence of an internet and the development of a laser and everything that involves electromagnetic waves uh, will rest upon these four equations. This might sound strange, but I mean that very sincerely. To me, that set of equations is quite beautiful in what it captures about our universe. And the fact that the human brain can conceive of that mathematics which captures that aspect of the universe. Remarkable. So a little bit more about science. So science is not a body of facts. I mean, it produces facts, that's true, but it's not a body of facts. Science is a method, big difference, for deciding whether what we choose to believe has a basis in the laws of nature. That's what science does, right, in the mathematics of science. So a scientific theory is a well-substantiated explanation of some aspect of the natural world that's acquired using the scientific method, and then repeatedly tested and confirmed observation and experiment. So when we use the word scientific theory, those are actually our most beloved aspects of science. There is universal agreement among scientists that they're A, correct, because they've been test tested a thousand different times in a million different ways, and they always prove to be correct. Uh, examples of that would be gravity, thermodynamics, plate tectonics, evolution, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so science aims for a consensus of truth. By definition, a single instance of a counterexample to a hypothesis will crash your theory. And so people actually, science is the only discipline I can think of where if you can prove somebody else wrong, you can become very famous. Einstein's a great example. Yeah, prove Newton. Yeah, Newton, no, no, that's wrong, right? And uh, so that's, uh, that kind of gets you in the game here. So science aims for a consistent a consensus of truth. So if somebody tells you, for instance, that you know, 97, 99% of climate scientists believe that climate change is a real thing, uh, you would do well probably to believe them, right? Because it means there's this whole body of, uh, of evidence that uh, backs that up and it's generally accepted by all the practitioners of that field, right? Does science make mistakes? Well, that's interesting. As a scientist, I'd like to believe not, but that's absolutely false. Of course it makes mistakes. Yeah, we get things wrong. Uh, but it's important to appreciate that science as a discipline is self-correcting. It figures out its mistakes and moves forward. Results are always provisional. That's the way science works. Subject to disproof and peer review, mistakes happen, but they don't persist. Again, because people can get famous by proving you wrong, right? People have a vested interest in getting science right. It may take a while, that's true. Uh, there are plenty of historical examples where science blew it, uh, but got it right at the end of the day. The takeaway, in my view, that's an opinion, this is a contentious subject, uh, is that doubting science is a losing game. Why do I say that? Well, you're basically saying that verifiable facts really have no basis, uh, they don't matter, uh, and that the world is not rational. That's at the core of what it means to be a human person, and I hope you don't subscribe to that. So think again, I would say. Don't doubt the reality of science and all that it has done for us, uh, but, um, but uh, you know, so, so accept that fact. But let me ask you a simple question. Does science rest upon unprovable assumptions? Well, that would be a little unsettling if science rests upon things that I can't prove with science, wouldn't it? <laughs> Uh, well, the answer is it does, in fact, right? Science rests upon things which are unprovable by definition. Let me give you some examples. Fundamental assumptions of science is that there is an objective reality shared by all rational observers. They're really real. 
The second is that th that objective reality is governed by immutable, unchanging natural laws, and it might, would, should be the same on Earth as it is a thousand light years from Earth, right? We have no basis to know why that should be so, but it's an assumption. And finally, these natural laws can be discovered by means of systematic observation and experimentation. Have you ever stopped to wonder, why is it that math actually works? <laughs> Why is it the human brain can come up with the concept of a mathematics that actually gives me a description of the uh, nature as it surrounds us? That's just a remarkable fact to me. It doesn't have to be so, right? It follows the rules of logic, and, uh, and it seems to work. But these are actually unprovable things, right? These are uh, premises upon which science rests. So then does science depend upon faith? If it rests upon unprovable things, it depends upon faith. Well, I would say, well, what do you mean by faith, actually? So I would say, well, by faith, I mean a strong belief in the absence of some formal proof. So if it rests upon unprovable assumptions, I think you could make the argument, or at least you should think about the argument, that, hmm, I don't know, what does that mean, actually? And there's this. Sad to say, whether you appreciate it or not, mathematics, this amazing thing that we people here at Georgia Tech spend a lot of our lives doing, uh, this dazzlingly powerful workhorse of science cannot, even in principle, prove its own logical self-consistency. You mean math can't prove that math is right? <laughs> yeah, it can't, actually. Kurt Gödel showed that in 1931 with his famous incompleteness theorems. Uh, that, uh, to my mind, is a major bummer, right? Why, that, that, that's terrible, right? <laughs> math can't prove its own consistency? Well, if you're going to base physics upon math and math can't prove its own consistency and science has got assumptions, then you, know, you get the idea there. What's an honest scientist to do? I'm one. Uh, well, stop insisting on a theory of everything. Theory of everything, you know, from the movie, hopefully, or remember Stephen Hawking, remember that? Uh, where he says, let's take the four fundamental net f forces of nature, let's reduce those to, to a single framework of a single theory which captures everything. Even Stephen Hawking today, in the presence of the incompleteness theorem, has backed away from that uh, dream in some sense, meaning, uh, yeah, probably not going to happen in that way, because the mathematics that it takes to do that even uh, has its own inherent limitations. It ain't going to happen. That's my view. But... Uh, yeah, but uh, that's not something to think too hard about. So the important question, actually, that I want to now explore is, is science the only reliable means for obtaining the truth? This truth, the really real, objective reality, is science the only way to do that? Well, I, my answer to that would be, it depends on who you listen to. These are contentious topics. Uh, scientism, as it is known today, is the worldview that insists that science provides the only means of knowing what is true, what the really real is. There's nothing besides science, in other words. If science can't answer it, it doesn't exist. That's called scientism. The New Atheist Movement, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, that crew uh, subscribe to that idea, right? And yet, there are these. The big questions of life. I think about big questions. My biggest caveat and concern about social media is that it tends to prevent people from thinking about the big questions. Uh, and if it's doing that for you, you're missing out on many, many things, actually. When I'm up in the mountains, lost in the wilderness, hiking, my favorite thing to do, and you look up at the night sky and with a sense of awe and wonder and majesty, uh, I don't know about you, I think about big questions, deep questions, questions that don't have answers to them, but are absolutely the essence of what it means to be a human person. Let me give you a few. Why is there something rather than nothing? You might say, well, that's silly. Of course there's something. Well, why? <laughs> right? There's no easy answer to that. Why something and not nothing? Why am I here at this particular time in this particular place? I wonder that. Does the universe have a purpose? Uh, does God exist? Do we have free will? Is there life after death? Uh, is there an absolute best moral system? Uh, the list is just on and on and on, right? Questions that have no easy answers uh, that uh, I think absolutely uh, command your attention, in fact, if you want to live life in a deep and introspective way. These are questions of meaning, questions of meaning. 
So what kinds of questions does science answer? Well, different kinds of questions. Science is very, very good at answering questions of mechanism. By that, I mean how questions. How does this work? Not questions of meaning. Why is this the way it is? Those are very different kinds of questions. Fundamentally, science can only address questions which can be subjected to the scientific method and all that that means, namely the physical causes of natural phenomena. It does that extraordinarily well. Uh, but by definition, questions of meaning, at least most of them, uh, are beyond the reach of science because it can't bring its engine to bear upon those in any meaningful way. And thus, one ends up with this, right? The world's religions. Because the world's religions, and I'll codify that in a second, um, exist pre precisely because of questions of meaning they aren't easily answered. Just a couple of factoids that I found interesting when I first came across them. Did you know that 83% of people believe in a personal God? That's a lot of people. Uh, and 12% more, actually, maybe they don't believe in God, but they believe in some higher uh, divine spirit, right? Here's kind of a remarkable fact. If you, uh, if you come back and ask the same, well, so if you're going to care for a surprise, I stole my own thunder there. Uh, and you come, back, you, 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 you come back and say, well, how about scientists? What do they think? Actually, well, 33% of scientists actually believe in a personal God. Yeah, I'll count myself in that. But it's not rare, right? And you'll notice that 18% more believe in a higher power, and actually 48% of scientists have some religious affiliation. Doesn't mean they're active, but they have some affiliation, right? So that, uh, I guess my point being is that religion, even in those practitioners of science that we've been talking about, uh, it's not uncommon actually to A, wrestle with these questions of meanings, and B, to subscribe to a religious or at least spiritual worldview. But what is exactly uh, religion? What, what is it? Well, that's kind of a slippery animal, right? Yeah, it's that thing I go to if I'm a Christian on Sunday. Yeah, okay, but that's not what religion is, right? Uh, let me define that for you. Uh, uh, definition number one, belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, somebody that we often call God. Uh, number two, I'm going in levels of sophistication. You'll notice the general, generality is increasing. A unified system of beliefs and practices relative to sacred thing. That's Emil you know, Durkheim. Uh, answer three, the substance, the ground, and the depth of humankind's spiritual life. I kind of like that, but it's not good. Uh, number four, by Houston Smith, a way of life woven around a people's ultimate concerns. Uh, I was informed when I got into this field that, yeah, none of those work. Not in 2017. We know much more about global religions today than when these came around. Here's one, number five. This is the one to take to the bank. A cultural system of behaviors and practices, mythologies and worldviews, sacred texts, holy places, ethics, and societal organization that relate humanity to a higher plane of existence. That's OK. You know how I know? My son, who is a professor of religious <laughs> studies, he blessed that. I said, I said Matt, you've got to help me here. How do I define religion? And he said, well, use this one. And it said, so he, he blessed that. Right? So it's, it's been blessed. Uh, Matthew's the one that just had a little baby girl, Jane. So uh, yeah. So yeah, well, he knows what he's talking about. He's a professor of religious studies, right? Um, let me contrast knowledge and belief and faith. I'm looking at things which science values and things which religion values. And I want to begin to intersect those and ask what it means for us as individuals. The key question that is, I think is a really important question, particularly for young people, but actually for all of us, and that is, must we leave our intellect, our rationality, and our reason behind if we are to be serious about religion? As a scientist, I will tell you, that would be, really bum me out if I had to. <laughs> but let me make a couple of points there. Uh, there is a societal bias and perception out there. You, I think, will agree with this. Knowledge, in a general sense, society would say, well, that's scientific and objective and factual and shared by all. It's a communal enterprise. Uh, belief and faith, on the other hand, that is unscientific, subjective, anecdotal, disputable, private, and personal. What you believe, great, uh, but it's not for everybody, right? 
Importantly, actually, as I have come to discover myself, uh, these attributes don't really accurately reflect the way the human mind works. This point was borne out to me by Adam Hinks, who is presently over in the Vatican. He's actually kind of unique sort of person. I love people like this. He's a Jesuit priest, uh, and he's also an astrophysicist, practicing astrophysicist. And so he said, well, you need to think about that a little bit differently. And these aren't his ideas, right? This goes all the way back to Aquinas, right? But rule number one, he said, is that we should not treat belief as an arbitrary choice or a matter of personal taste. It actually is a point of access to something both objective and true. Uh, belief and knowledge are intimately interlocking uh, rational processes. Uh, and belief is required when processes that generate knowledge we desire are not directly accessible to us. That actually happens in science. Appreciate that, for instance. How many of you have directly tested uh, Newton's theory of gravity out in the lab? I haven't, um, but I assume I believe it to be so, right? Mm, because it rests upon things which I hold dear and value. Uh, but again, we have to have belief to wrap our head around things which are not directly accessible to us, even in the world of science. Rule number four, science and religion must include both knowledge and belief. Uh, and rule number five, faith comes to the table, faith, religious faith, uh, for things that are beyond both knowledge and belief. Fair enough. Uh, but importantly, he makes the point, and I tend to agree with him, that rules number one through four are things that science and religion do. That's actually quite significant to me. Uh, so the question is, must we leave our intellect and rationality and reason behind if we're to be serious about religion? Uh, I would say no. Uh, that's my opinion, of course. Uh, but I think there's good reasons to believe that. The net of that is that authentic religious faith guarantees the validity of human re reason, which, of course, is the bedrock of science and all that that means. Uh, that actually is important to me. I don't want to give up my reason and rationality to be a person of faith. <clears throat> Interestingly, and this is a recent development in the field that is absolutely riveting to me, is that this opens the door to a much more holistic view of the interaction of science and religion. Uh, it is the hotbed in theological circles, this kind of discussion that I'm going to allude to here. What's the perceived relationship by the average person on the street between science and religion? It looks something like this, I think. Uh, so the knee-jerk reaction is like, yeah, science is that mad dog, and religion is that mad dog, or maybe it's religion on that side and science on that side, but uh, they're kind of at each other's throat ready if you yank the chain away that they're going to grab each other, right, and it's not going to end well. Um, and there's some good reasons to have that opinion, right? You know the story, nuanced as it is, of Galileo. Uh, he got himself into a lot of trouble himself, and, but you don't want to take on the Inquisition, right, with your ideas. That's a bad idea. Uh, and uh, so there was a lot of contention there around that. It's, again, a nuanced story, so there's a lot of things I won't go into here. Uh, you know Darwin and evolution. Clearly, that's a very contentious thing these days. Uh, although I will tell you that it, when Origin of Species came out, uh, there were people in the religious circle that welcomed that event as an insight into the way the human person has evolved. And of course that played out in the, uh, the famous Scopes monkey trial, you know that. Uh, the state of Tennessee versus John Scopes, uh, quite a theatrical enterprise. But uh, so there are, and there's dozens of those contentious issues between science and religion, no, no argument at all about that. But in my view, it's my view, uh, the contentious relationship between science and religion that many people think is there is actually overblown. Uh, and it's kind of unnecessary, at least if you view things in the right way, and evolving as we speak. And that's, of course, in the title of my talk. So this is, again, a topic which is uh, at the forefront of theological discussion that relates to science. And I think it's actually profoundly exciting in terms of these developments. Let me give you an example. I think it's fun to just go through various religious traditions in 2017. So what do they actually teach? Uh, well, I'll give you one that's near and dear to my heart, and that's uh, the Catholic Church. So I didn't tell you when I told you I was a religious person. Actually, I'm Catholic. Uh, I have a deep leaning to Jesuits uh, and Ignatian spirituality. But if you go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which codifies the beliefs of what it means to be Catholic, number 283 says, the question about the origins of the world 
and of man have been the object of many scientific studies which have splendidly enriched our knowledge of the age and dimensions of the cosmos, the development of life forms, and the appearance of man. These discoveries invite us to an even greater admiration of the greatness of the Creator, prompting us to give Him thanks for all His works and the understanding of wisdom He gives scholars and researchers. That doesn't sound to me like crossed swords doing battle, right, between the two. And you can go to other faith traditions. I pulled three here, but you choose your favorite one, right? So in Islam, whoever treads a path seeking in that path knowledge, Allah will make easy for him the path to paradise. I write love stories set in medieval Spain. The medieval Muslim Spaniards uh, were absolutely all over science in the popularization and development of science. It's a fascinating period of time. Now, the Dalai Lama and Buddhism Suppose that something is definitely proven through scientific investigation and that a certain hypothesis is verified or a certain fact emerges as a result of that investigation. And suppose, furthermore, that that fact is incompatible with what we teach as Buddhists. Yeah, there's no doubt then you have to accept the scientific result and rethink what you mean about your religion, right? That's fair. If you go to the Baha'i faith, religion without science leads to superstition. Science without religion leads to materialism. The relationship between science and religion actually can be broken into three interactive models. Uh, and uh, uh, this kind of captures the, your options, if you would, right? You could take one of these three, one of which I think is far more exciting than the other two, but I'll leave that up to you. The first is the conflict position, and that says basically science and religion are absolutely opposed to each other and unreconcilable. Unre uh, meaning if you are a person with a science a scientism worldview that thinks religion is a, a grand delusion and a waste of time, and on the other side, you are of a faith tradition that insists that the earth is only 6,000 years old, even though evolution tells us something very different, yeah, it's going to be hard for you to have dialogue and make progress between those two. Far more common, I think, is the, the so-called contrast position, and that kind of echoes what I said earlier. Science and religion are distinct enterprises. They have their usefulness in those enterprises. They're not opposed to each other. No conflict can exist between them because they respond to very different questions, questions of mechanisms, questions of meaning. Uh, so there's narrower competition between them, so really no real conflict. I think that's actually a fairly common thing. So I'm a religious scientist. I'm not speaking to myself. I'm a religious scientist, and I put my science over here, and I put my religion over here, and that's fine as long as I don't ever let them talk to each other. But that, of course, is not a great way to synthesize your own worldview as a human person. And I don't find that particularly satisfying. The third method is called convergence. And it builds upon contrast. This is the exciting one to me. It's quite contemporary, in fact, last uh, couple of decades. Science and religion are distinct because they have different kinds of questions. That's true. And they, but they may still interact fruitfully. Convergence tries to move beyond both conflict and contrast to a richer and more nuanced perspective. Uh, one that allows ample room for conversation between science and religion. Uh, it focuses especially on the theological implications of what is referred to today as the new cosmic story. I'll show you that in one second. This is actually new. A proponent of that is uh, Professor John Hott at Georgetown. There's many, actually, in theological circles. John has been here this year and last year on campus, uh, a great individual. Uh, he sees that as a profoundly exciting time to think of a fuller truth that may be possible between meaningful dialogue between scientific and religious worldviews. I share that view. Care for an example of how religion can benefit from science? Yeah, I'll give you one. There's many you could go to. Uh, this new cosmic story, as I referred to, that's Hot's term, but I like it. Uh, we know a lot of things about our universe, pretty definitively, actually. Uh, we know that it's about 13.8 billion years of history, going back to something which is popularly known as the Big Bang event, the singularity of space-time. Lots of things happened, and 13.8 uh, billion years later, here we are. Now, there's things we don't quite understand, right? Dark matter, dark energy, there's mysteries, no question. Uh, but it's a fascinating fact that unification of electromagnetics, Maxwell's equations, uh, and quantum theory, will take you to about a nanosecond of explanatory power, uh, about a nanosecond after the Big Bang event. Think about that a second. 13.8 billion years, I'm going to take you back to a nanosecond after it happened, and I can tell you what happened? Yeah, we, we, we can do that. 
Uh, that's a pretty astounding thing. This is Hart's view of that. I, li I like it, actually. It, it tells you a few things. And the point I want to make, the point to glean from this, is that evolution is not something that is a few hundred thousand years old. Evolution stretches back to the beginning of the Big Bang event. Right? That has very profound theological implications. Here's what Hart said. He said, well, the age of the universe, 13.8 billion years, let's imagine that it's made with a series of 30 books of that history. And each book has 450 pages. And each page is a million years. So 30 books of 450 million years each. Uh, and so I want to put some time stamps on those. The Big Bang happened on the first line of page one <laughs> in volume one, clearly. Uh, and then nothing happens for 10 billion years. 10 billion years! What's going on? Well, actually, important things are going on. What's happening is stellar evolution is happening. The universe is expanding. And you've heard it said, I hope, in a song or otherwise, that we are stardust. So the supernova events are creating the heavy atoms that will eventually make life possible, given sufficient time. And here's sufficient time. So you get to volume 21. That's the Earth story. So Earth has been around a while. But there was 10 billion years when the Earth wasn't here. Uh, life begins in volume 22. Fascinating topic. How did life actually start? Well, we're not sure yet, but there's several dozen people on campus that are trying desperately to figure that answer out. I think it's a fascinating field. And how it, if we know how that happens here, how did it happen in other worlds? Uh, modern humans, you and I, what we do, what makes us human, intelligence, ethics, faith traditions, whatever you want to point to, happens in volume 30 on the last page, in the last paragraph. So you could legitimately ask, uh, why so long? <laughs> That's known in theological circles. I love the term because it's so appealing. Deep time, right? It's, it's not long, it's deep time. So deep time does amazing things in the development of the human person. So the question for you, that deep question, that night sky question, is, is this compatible, a view of science and a view of religion, knowing that this new cosmic story is again an evolutionary journey which isn't a few hundred thousand years or a million years, it's actually uh, the entire essence of the universe's history, 13.8 billion years. For many religions, yeah, they are compatible in fact. Uh, I find that a remarkable thing. Now, if you go back and look in antiquity, you yes, say, well, no, they, no. But today, you know, many religions, not all, clearly, but many religions uh, have no problem reconciling those two worldviews. Let me expose you to what is known as the anthropic principle, because it is an aspect of cosmological physics which has profound theological implications, at least to me. Uh, if you don't know what that is, let me tell you in a, a terrible mouthful. I'm going to translate it in one second. The anthropic principle is the metaphysical premise, I'm talking philosophy now, uh, that the universe in the precise form in which we observe it in 2017 must be compatible with the development of conscious and intelligent life that's actually doing the looking. <laughs> what I actually mean is the universe was created to produce us. In other words, we're looking back in the 13.8 billion years from the vantage point, vantage point of modern time, uh, and the anthropic principle says, well, that's not an accident, actually, that uh, there's physics that conditions that very fact, actually, as I will unpack for you in a second. This is the remarkable fact, which is accepted, by the way, by, to my knowledge, all practicing cosmologists of cosmic fine-tuning. The implications of it are debated still, but the, it's accepted fact. Let me give you some example of cosmic fine-tuning. It's a remarkable feature of our universe that we now know. The stunning fact is that the physical constants that define our universe, there's only six of them, are tuned very precisely to yield human life. That's what it seems like. Let me give you some examples. N, which is the ratio of the strength of the electromagnetism excuse me, to the strength of gravity for a pair of protons, that's obscure, I get it, but it's got physical basis, is approximately 1,036. If it was any smaller, 1,035, uh, only a small and short-lived universe would exist. We, we, we wouldn't be here, actually. If it was slightly different, not miles different, slightly different. Uh, epsilon, the strength of the, the uh, force binding the nuclei is 0 0.007. If it were only 0 0.006, only hydrogen would exist, and complex chemistry wouldn't happen. No us. If it were 0 0.008, uh, 
uh, no hydrogen would exist, no us. Yeah, so that, uh, that, uh, that, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> lambda is the cosmological constant. Check this out if you're a fan of zeros. 10 with minus 122. 122 zeros in front of one. If it were identically zero and not this ridiculously close to zero, the stars and other large scale astronomical structures wouldn't form and hence we wouldn't be here. So the universe's constants, the way the physics is wrapped up together, is precisely tuned, fine-tuned, uh, in incredible, with incredible precision to uh, produce the things over 13.8 billion years. It had to be so, that 10 billion years of nothingness uh, to produce us. Uh, hint, there are clearly theological implications of that. Now, it's debated. I fully concede that. It's debated. Not everybody believes that. You could come in and use what's known as the quantum many world hypothesis, right? Which is, yeah, well, that may be so. I don't doubt that. But what if there's an infinite number of universes and we just got lucky, right? That's what I'm kind of glibly translating many worlds theory, but, uh, but that would be uh, one take on that. Yeah, that doesn't seem very appealing to me. So the evolution uh, is a long endeavor, and we aren't done yet, actually. We aren't done yet. So a path forward between these two uh, requires new thinking, actually. This notion of what does religion mean in the presence of scientific knowledge and the new cosmic story and fine-tuning and everything that we've learned, right? It's going to require you to rethink things a little bit. For instance, uh, let me give you an example of a rethinker. He was a man ahead of his time. His name was Teilhard de Chardin, a French person that lived in the last century. You can see he was a Jesuit priest. Go Jesuits. Um, and he was, uh, he was actually a geologist and paleontologist of, of some renown, in fact, well accepted. And he was a co-discoverer in the Gobi Desert of so-called Peking Man. And uh, he strongly believed. He actually was not only a scientist, he was a deep thinker about these questions, right? How is it that evolution happens? And what does that mean to my faith tradition? And how can I reconcile science and religion given that factual evidence of evolution? He felt strongly that science does not rule out divine purpose. But our understanding of God must change. Right? In other words, you can't hold on to, this is him, to this notion that you may had from the medieval period that God was X uh, in the presence of science. And what that means is I don't have to necessarily abandon my religious tradition, but I probably should take the time to think carefully of what that means to my conception of God in the presence of science. He did that. He also thought that the universe is still evolving, right? This is a 13.8 billion year history. Uh, it's just the beginning, actually, as crazy as that may seem. Uh, and it's evolving not only physically, but now that we human persons have the things that we have, empathy, love, uh, mathematics, everything with that, but also spiritually, in fact. So the cosmos, he believed, is still unfolding drama. He called the the it's the drama of the universe, the unfolding narrative of the universe's story. Uh, he viewed primordial matter, or these, you know, these 10 billion years of nothingness, and then atoms and molecules and cells and organisms and vertebrates and primates, and here we come, 13.8 billion years later. Uh, and then there's something called the newosphere, which is this spiritual realm when our spirituality has grown as a civilization, not just as an individual and eventually what he termed the omega point, which is a journey back to God. Now, believe that or not, some people do, some people don't, but it's an interesting perspective. On the left, what you have in this evolutionary story is an increased in organized complexity, and at the same time, and I find this fascinating, a corresponding increase in the consciousness of the human animal, which I think is very intriguing thought. So Teilhard invites us to broaden our limited understanding of God. If you want to reconcile God and science, at least in his Catholic tradition, uh, you better rethink God a little bit, right? Uh, and he viewed very much that science and faith are both essential because they're rational processes uh, to this gradual awakening of humankind, which is intended from the very beginning of 13.8 billion years of history and counting. So does the relation, how does the relationship between science and religion continue to mature and grow? That's a good question. It's a contentious issue today. I stepped into this audience 
talking about very contentious things. Please don't throw things at me, right? But, uh, but it's, it's something that we need to think about. And I would say the way to do that is to begin with a, a, an open-minded conversation of this topic and all that it means and all of the confusion and all of the deep questions and the unanswerables. Those are important things to wrestle with. That was actually uh, my vision for creating a very unique course at Georgia Tech. I don't know how many students are here, but if you're one of my students from this class for a couple of years, raise your hand. Yeah, there's a few of you here. Uh, yeah, don't be shy. Come on, Beatrice. Um, so uh, my, my sense, and actually this was revealed to me on a spiritual retreat, uh, this aspect was, uh, wouldn't it be important for young people particularly, but even myself for that matter, to have the venue to talk about these issues? and do that in a unique way. So I introduced this course, Science, Engineering, and Religion, from an interfaith perspective. So it gathers together all faith traditions and even agnostic and atheistic worldviews to tease these things out. What do they mean, right? I've offered that twice now. It's a remarkable thing, just for you Georgia Tech students, that I, as a physicist who is an electrical engineering professor, am permitted to teach in the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts. It's a scary thought. I get that. Uh, <laughs> But they let me do it, right? So I like to think that you know, anything at Georgia Tech that's a good idea is probably, it can happen. Yeah, it can happen. And now Ken has bought into that vision, and it'll be a permanent thing. It's now been formally adopted by the permanent curriculum at Tech, actually. Uh, if you happen to be interested in that, uh, I'll show you. Pardon me for a second, everybody else. Uh, beginning of October, applications will begin if you're interested in taking a course like this. Yeah, it sounds crazy, but you do have to apply, right? Uh, because I'm after people of diverse worldviews. So you can talk to me or other students about that if you're interested. So that's, uh, yeah, there's some of them here. They're, uh, they're, they're about as gifted and questing a group of young people as I've ever been around. They wanted to ask the deep questions. And I sat back and I joined them in those askings. Uh, and it was a remarkably fulfilling activity. We have a great time and a lot of fun, but we ask lots of deep and perplexing questions. So Teilhard said, uh, to ignore the universe and its evolution, science, is to settle for a diminished sense of ourselves, of Christ and of God, right? That was his feeling. Uh, and I personally think that would be a real shame. 